Eagle Dynamics DCS World is a big game, and as the saying goes, the world is your oyster, and this is very true in DCS. It has 36 playable planes that range from early World War II, like the I-16, and stretches out all the way to modern jets like the F-18, and includes helicopters as advanced as the Apache. The game covers a wide era, but it, it does not cover them all equally. There are countless planes that exist between World War II and the mid-2000s, but only so many are playable in DCS. So the next natural question is, which one should you fly? With so many planes in DCS and a cost per module ranging anywhere from $30 to $80, and each one with their own steep learning curve, it becomes quite a big question to wrestle with. I would like to introduce a thought and actually say you shouldn't focus on the module, but rather focus on the era that you want to play in. What is it do you really want to do? Breaking down the entire span of DCS, you have World War II or Warbirds, Cold War, and Modern or BVR. Out of all of these eras, DCS shines the brightest in Cold War, and this is what this video is about. I think the DCS community has sort of gotten ahead of itself by gravitating toward the most complex and advanced modules, and it's developed into a habit with a lot of people going against the grain here, but in this video, I will make my case why Cold War is the best era in DCS, why I think it's the future of DCS, and I will break down some of the Cold War communities that you can check out to enjoy that era. If this is your first time here, this channel focuses on multiplayer same gameplay, so if you're into that, please subscribe. There are many reasons why Cold War is the best era. Let's get into the first one. At the time of this recording, there are 36 playable helicopters and airplane modules in DCS. They are not equally distributed across the eras. When you take the entire list and then bucket them into World War II, Cold War, and Modern, you will see what I mean. Now, looking at this list, it still appears that Modern, or BVR, and Cold War both have a decent amount of modules on their own. If you go a step deeper and organize them between blue and red, then you'll see what I mean. The distribution in era and per side is not close to equal, and that is a problem and a reason why Cold War is the best era in DCS. Why is modern lacking so many Red 4 aircraft? Eagle Dynamics is striving to make the most realistic combat flight simulator, and with that comes some major legal hurdles. By entering and maintaining a presence in the modern era, they do run into the issue of state secrets. There is only so much that they are allowed to model by the Russian government. So basically, the modern settings is filled to the gills with modern Blue 4 aircraft, and the Red 4 side is seriously lacking and it makes for a huge imbalance. This affects gameplay quite dramatically because the server owners are limited in what they can and can't do to balance their mission scenarios. Do they scale back the weapons and systems of planes or do they give Blue 4 planes over to Red? In a game that strives to be the most realistic combat flight simulator, the norm in some of the most populated modern servers is Blue versus Blue combat. Basically, AIM-120s being fired to and from Falcons and Hornets. To me, this is not interesting. And it makes gameplay very shallow because it doesn't lean into what I think combat flight simulators are really about. Having fights that are asymmetrical, pitting aircraft of different types into combat settings is interesting. Players are forced to lean into their plane's advantages and to try to take away the advantages of their opponents. At this time, this is only possible in the Cold War setting in DCS. It is the only era in DCS where there is parity between the both sides. Both sides get planes that are near to each other in terms of capabilities and are true to their side when they come from different design philosophies. The MiG is, flies very different from the F-5, but the MiG and the F-5 is a pretty even matchup. This allows for interesting settings to play in that are engaging and it highlights what makes combat flight simulators really fun. Let's look into the near immediate and confirmed future to see what the playable module state will look like. Does the situation that I present in Reason 1 continue in the near future? The MiG-23, the F-8 Crusader, the Mirage F-1, the A-7 Corsair, the F-4 Phantom, and some other potential modules like the A-6 Intruder, the MiG-17, and the full fidelity MiG-29 are coming. When you compare the Cold War pipeline to the modern or World War II pipeline, you see what I mean. The problem in the modern setting actually becomes worse while the situation in the Cold War era continues to get better. Additionally, some of the new aircraft coming in the game really laid down a foundation to bring Cold War to a whole new level. For example, let's look at the MiG-23. Red 4 has no FOX-1 missiles that a player can fire between the 1960s R-3R and the 1980s R-27 missile. 
There's a 20 year gap in Fox 1 missile technology and the MiG-23 will most likely bring the R-23 or at least the R-24 to the picture. It's covering and bridging a large gap that's existed in the game. It's only going to get better for Cold War. Here's a modern BVR setting. You are targeting and shooting at pixels that you can't see with your eyes, but can only see on your radar screen. You climb to altitude, lock onto someone, hope you are faster than them, and let it rip. You don't really need to worry about what they are carrying because they most likely have the same missile as you do because it's a modern setting and it's just AMRAMs versus AMRAMs. Am I generalizing? Yes. But at the end of the day, the missile is doing most of the work because the engagement ranges are so far away. Now compare this to Cold War. The missiles are terrible. They eat flares for breakfast and your next option are FOX-1 missiles, which are just as bad. By playing in a setting where missiles are worse you actually make the fights more interesting. You have to help your missiles by maneuvering into a position where you give yourself a high percent chance of hitting. When we look at the range of missiles on the Cold War server, we see that the hit percentages of most of the early to mid Cold War missiles range from 15 to 35%. The majority of the missiles are not meeting their target, and that is because the missiles are not an instant win button. Maneuvering in a dogfight is very important, and your position in the fight determines whether your missile has a chance or not. Learning the flight characteristics of your plane and of your opponents and what maneuvers can and can't be done at certain times in a dogfight requires study. This leans into what DCS is, it's a study sim. In contrast, learning what buttons need to be pressed and what order to operate a modern F-18 doesn't really require studying, but it's just memorization in a way because the variables that you have to deal with are so limited in a modern setting. By playing in a more engaging setting that asks more of you and rewards you with more compelling gameplay, elevates your skills and it translates to any airframe that you play in the near future. Lastly, the air-to-ground game, in my opinion, is almost more interesting in Cold War. Seed is not an instant win button like it is in modern uh, seed missiles. You have to work your way into air defenses and not rely on guided munitions to blow away your targets. This is more interesting and it lead for more engaging gameplay. DCS modules have a lot of things modeled. Just by using Chuck's guide as a barometer, we see that the average length for his F-18 and F-16 guides is about 725 pages, while for Cold War modules like the MiG-21 and the F-5, the average length is 282 pages. Basically, the modern modules take a lot more time investment to learn the basic systems. Colder planes are the opposite. The systems are all basic. The radars aren't all seeing eyes. The RWRs are somewhat useful. And your most complicated key map is probably figuring out how to switch from cannons or to missiles. Instead of taking a week getting up to speed on a module, you can get everything mapped in under 15 minutes and getting up in the air soon after. Translating things between colder modules is pretty simple because ultimately the systems are very basic. But with less emphasis on the systems, it puts more emphasis and a need to be proficient in flying and combat maneuvering. As the previous point mentioned, the fights are basically all within visual range, and because of the bad missiles, your position in a fight is key. This is what I meant earlier about playing a study sim. Learning how to fight and to win into a dogfight takes study and practice. When you play DTS as much as I do, and play as many modules as I do, you really start to occupy a lot of mental real estate in your head on how you fly each individual plane. The size of this mental real estate grows exponentially if you fly modern planes. I am not a teen anymore. I have a lot of things to do in my personal and professional life. If I do not play a modern plane for four weeks and I try to come back to it, I will forget half the things and struggle. If I were to take the same break and come back to a Cold War plane, there really isn't that much to forget because everything is so basic. Additionally, dogfighting, once you get it, is like riding a bike and I can slide right back into the game, no problem. This translates you into being able to fly many different planes of the same era and to be proficient in them all. This upskills the community within the era and it makes for more engaging gameplay. You aren't running into the same S16 or F18 every fight. You run into a Frogfoot doing cast or a MiG-21 doing cap or a Viggen doing deep strike. This makes for more asymmetrical fights and for more engaging gameplay. Now that we have set the stage for why Cold War is the best era in DCS and why it'll continue to be the future of DCS, we can dive into the different Cold War communities. The era is so large that there are multiple communities that anchor themselves in it 
and have their own distinct take on Cold War. For players that are interested in a dynamic, persistent campaign setting, then you have our server to play on. We have something not really done anywhere else in DCS, and we have the largest Cold War server. We have a dynamic campaign that is set in the 1960s to 1970s era, where the emphasis is objective-centered gameplay. Attacking frontline targets, deep strikes on industrial or logistical targets are all possible, and they all help to push the front line. The server is a PvP server, so you are trying to push the front line while the players on the other side are doing the exact same thing. This allows for a lot of spontaneous moments and it is truly dynamic. We are anchored around the 1960s and 1970s era and only allow Fox 1 and Fox 2 missiles. For air to ground, we typically focus on rockets and unguided bombs, with a few exceptions. The server is PvP, but it offers a 24-7 war that gives you a lot that gives you a lot of options to do, which includes a lot of uh, bombing of PvE targets. Formerly known as Syria at War, the team at Flashpoint Levant have rebranded and have created a very compelling PvE cooperative server. The setting of the server is slightly later than my own server. This means that some later Cold War airframes like the Mirage 2000 or Flanker are available. Players basically get on and help push the frontline against the enemy AI. This is a great server for, more, for a more chill environment where you are just trying to play with friends but don't have to worry about PvP. The Flashpoint Levant team have a lot of experience running a server as they used to be part of the Hoggett umbrella under the name of Syria at War. Cold War 1947 to 1991, or also known as Alpen Wolves, is, as far as I know, the longest standing Cold War server in DCS. I would like to describe this server as the DCS version of IL-2's combat box server. What I mean by that is that the server offers a lot of boutique missions that are all custom made based around a certain era. Missions range as early as the Korean War and as and late as the 90s. They typically last a couple of hours and then it'll switch to an entirely new uh, mission so, so nothing carries over. Uh, very interesting missions and can be have a lot of fun on there. To summarize and to bring my point home, if your interest in a combat flight simulator is to get immersed into a fleshed out combat scenario where there are planes from different design philosophies, parity between both sides, a fairly historical plane set, then Cold War is your best bet. If you want to do less combat and more cockpit simulation, then the modern setting is your thing to go deep on. I'm not knocking either side, but for me personally, I have made the leap and I'm at the point now where I have uninstalled all of my modern modules and will most likely not be playing modern again. The tech ceiling for me is the Flanker or the Mirage 2000. I hope you think about what I said and that you feel encouraged to make the jump into Cold War. In my book, DCS essentially already is a Cold War simulator. And as you think about the points that I laid out, it will become more and more obvious as the years go by. At some point, DCS will run out of things to model in the modern era, as they are only limited to really modeling out Blue 4. I hope this video acts as a call to arms for people who have been wanting more out of DCS. I firmly believe that in every DCS player, there is a Cold War player that needs to be brought to the light. If you agree or disagree with me, please leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts. I read every single reply that you guys make. If you found this video interesting or helpful, please consider subscribing and hitting the like button as this is the best way to have this video reach other players. Thank you and have a good one.